If you were stuck in an apocalypse where any noise could mean certain death, what would you do? After surviving for over a year while being hunted by ultra-aggressive creatures straight out of your worst nightmares, this family is going to have to journey into the outside world for the first time, and they're about to find out the hard way that bloodthirsty aliens aren't the only threat. We're gonna break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the alien death machines in A Quiet Place Part 2. <laughs> it's a sunny morning in the quiet town of Millbrook, New York, and the Abbott family are settling in to watch their oldest son Marcus's big baseball game. The father, Lee, takes a spot on the bleachers next to his deaf daughter, Reagan, and their neighbor, Emmett, while his wife, Evelyn, and their youngest son, Bo, are busy playing together on the swings. They're listening to the Red Sox game on Emmett's radio until, for some reason, the broadcast starts to cut out. All at once, everyone in the crowd suddenly goes completely quiet as they notice a large, meteor-like object falling from the sky in the distance. Lee is the first to react, quietly grabbing his daughter and agreeing to meet the rest of the family back at home. On his way back to the truck, Lee notices one of the town police officers pulling over in front of the pharmacy, so he stops to ask him what's going on. Suddenly, a strange alien creature crashes into the officer's car, and Lee immediately sprints back to his truck, but he isn't able to get it started. At the same time, Evelyn and the boys are suddenly attacked by the creature while caught in a traffic jam out on the main road. Terrified, she punches on the gas and turns to get out of there, but has to throw it in reverse when a runaway bus that's been attacked by another one of the creatures comes speeding towards them, causing her to crash into the town's only traffic light. Seeing this, Reagan starts to run towards them, but Lee quickly grabs her and ducks into a restaurant along with a dozen other survivors, while the creature continues tearing people up on the streets outside. Everyone goes goes silent as they see the creature searching for them through the windows, but someone forgot to put their phone on vibrate, and the moment that it rings, the creature immediately dives through the window, tearing everyone in its path to shreds as Lee and Reagan rush out the back door. They make it to the streets with the creature right behind them, running towards the overturned cruiser where the rest of their family are hiding. Grabbing his shotgun, the injured officer opens fire on the creature as Lee and Reagan dive out of the way, hitting it several times, but it's no use. While the creature brutally kills off the officer just a few feet away. Okay, these aliens must really hate baseball. Talk about a rough day. One minute you're with your family enjoying a nice afternoon at the park, and the next you're running for your lives from an army of extraterrestrial super predators that can slice through the side of a bus like tearing a wet napkin. Lee and his family are going to have their work cut out for them if they're going to try and survive. And first, I think we should try to get a better understanding of what exactly we're up against. These terrifying creatures, officially known as the Death Angels, originate from a planet with no natural light, which explains why they've developed such ultra-sensitive hearing without ever having evolved the ability to see. When their planet was destroyed for unknown reasons, they rode the chunks that were left of it through space until they eventually crash-landed here on Earth, and boy was that a bad day for these people. Although these are just estimates, we could gauge that they stand about 9 feet tall when fully upright, and this is just based off the ending of the last movie, and weigh more than 400 pounds, making them extremely formidable, even before you take into account their natural armor that makes them almost impossible to damage with any form of conventional weapons. So, shotguns, missiles, fire, biological warfare, humanity has tried it all, and none of it worked. Earth's lower gravity compared to their home planet also gives them unbelievable strength and speed. Like some species that can already be found here on Earth, the creatures have evolved to use echolocation, a strategy developed by bats, dolphins, and some whales where the animal emits high-frequency sound waves and then interprets the echoes that bounce back from objects as a way to locate prey or perceive their surroundings. We can see this play out firsthand when Lee and Reagan are hiding in the restaurant as the creature emits a clicking sound while looking for them. This ultra-sensitive hearing is also their greatest weakness. So far, we've seen that the creatures literally do a blind rush for any source of sound, which should mean that noise could be used to lure them into a deadly trap. Of course, we already know that the key to taking one of them down is to get the creature to expose the soft parts on the inside of its armored skull by broadcasting an extremely high-pitched noise. But Lee has no idea about this yet, and even if he did, it's not 
not like he could just whip something up on the spot while having to avoid having his wife and his whole family like torn to pieces in front of him. There's no way for him to fight back right now, but if Lee knows one thing, it's that if you're going to run, then it's almost best to be the first person in the crowd to do it. Jim from the office face ass. Their only choice is to use the other pedestrians as meat shields until they can either find a good place to hide or manage to get away to a safe distance. The problem with hiding is that they don't know how the creatures sense or if and when they would ever leave. Lee probably has a feeling that they hunt by sound based on how things played out back at the restaurant, but he still doesn't know if these creatures can find you by your scent, electro reception, or some other sense that doesn't even exist here on Earth. As for their reactions, both Lee and Evelyn handled things about as well as they possibly could have given the pure chaos of the circumstances. It might have been better if they'd all stuck together in Evelyn's car, since Lee's truck clearly wasn't super reliable. But there's really nothing else that either of them could have done any better with so little time to prepare. There was a moment where it looked like Evelyn could have either made a sharp left or pulled quickly to the right to dodge the oncoming bus instead of trying to reverse away, but it's hard to say how how you'd react under such extreme pressure. The truth is that they were incredibly lucky to make it through this all in one piece. But luck isn't the only thing on their side. This is a family of survivors, and uh, over the next few months, they're going to do pretty well for themselves, all things considered, until one night when everything changes. The next time we see the family is 474 days later, and the world as we know it no longer exists. Evelyn, Reagan, Marcus, and the family's newborn son have just narrowly survived an encounter with the creatures at the secluded farmhouse where they've been hiding out. Lee was forced to sacrifice himself during the attack to protect the others, and Bo was killed by the creatures several months earlier. Evelyn enters the flooded barn to retrieve a crate that they've fashioned into a makeshift crib for the baby, and an oxygen mask that they've been using to keep him quiet when he cries. Meanwhile, Reagan doubles back into the basement, where she quickly puts together a device that she can use to amplify the feedback created by her cochlear implant, the only reliable method that they've found for getting the creatures to expose their weak points, as well as a map that her her father had been working on to track any potential pockets of civilization that might still exist. Later that evening, Reagan climbs to the top of the grain silo and lights a signal fire, just as her father had done on many nights in the past. To her surprise, she sees another fire burning over the mountains somewhere to the southeast, matching up exactly with a point on the map that her father had marked out but never had the chance to explore. In the morning, the family sets off through the countryside towards the source of the signal fire for the first time in more than a year. It seems like their only hope of ever returning to a normal life, but what they don't realize is they're about to walk straight into a death trap. Okay, this family has had a long journey ahead of them, and the first thing that they should do is make sure that they're adequately prepared. Not just for the creatures, but for anything else that they might encounter along the way. Personally, I'd want to get some walking shoes. I get that they're going for the whole bare feet or being quieter thing, but if we're about to walk a long distance, this could quickly become a problem. After all, the last thing that you want is to end up with some kind of gnarly foot infection while an army of four-legged death machines is trying to hunt you down. To make their shoes quieter, they could try attaching some layers of cushioned material to the bottom of their outer soles. This could involve using some adhesive to attach foam, cloth, or carpet it to the surfaces of the shoe that make contact with the ground, or even just pulling several pairs of oversized socks over the outside of the shoe instead. I'd also make sure to do a test run at the house before they go, just to make sure that everything's, you know, I. When they arrive at the place, instead of going straight in, I'd suggest trying to carefully observe the location from a distance for like a while without being discovered so that they can learn more about whoever lives there and decide if it's someone that they can trust. They could be looking to lure you in and score some easy supplies or worse, so it's better to be extra careful. They'll also want to consider whether they'd rather move during the day or at night. On the one hand, traveling at night could make you harder to detect by raiders, but traveling during the daylight makes you harder to detect for the monsters due to their natural sensitivity to light. Before 
Before even choosing to set out at all though, they need to think about the fact that they might be better off just staying there on the farm. They have a good system worked out for how to deal with threats, nobody knows where they are, and they have plenty of land to grow their own food, so it would definitely be possible for the family to sustain themselves here safely for a little while longer. That's a lot to consider, and we haven't really even gotten to talking about the creatures yet. We've seen that these things can close the distance fast and come at you from any angle. We also know that something about the creature's biology seems to have an effect on electrical components whenever they're present. This means that it could be beneficial to travel with a light or other small electronic device that does not produce any sound. That way, you'll be able to detect if any of the creatures are in the nearby area without giving your own location away. All in all, there's a good chance that this journey could turn out to be much more trouble than they bargained for. Let's just hope that whatever they find out there is worth it. The path eventually leads them to an abandoned rail yard, with the only way into the facility being a small hole in the chain link fence. Nervously, Evelyn pushes through first, making a small noise when her backpack gets caught on the wire. For now, it seems like they're still safe but as she turns around to keep an eye on the kids, Evelyn accidentally activates a tripwire trap that drops a cluster of noisy glass bottles. And that's when all hell suddenly breaks loose. Terrified, the family starts to run for their lives deeper into the compound, having no idea that someone is watching their every move through the high-powered scope of a hunting rifle. Marcus ends up in the front of the group, but they're so focused on escaping from the creatures that he steps directly onto a rusty bear trap, piercing straight through his ankle and causing him to scream at the top of his lungs in pain. Reagan places an oxygen mask over the crying baby's face and closes the lid on the crate, muffling his cries while her mother releases Marcus from the trap. They're able to get his foot free just in time, but sure enough, all of that noise attracted one of the creatures, and it's making a beeline straight for them. But Reagan knows exactly what to do. Using her amplifier, she boosts the feedback from her cochlear implant, stunning the creature and forcing it to open its armored head as Evelyn finishes it off with a single well-placed shot, so the family quickly rushes into the building, where they suddenly run into a lone survivor who has his face covered. With no time for instructions, they follow the man as he leads them deeper and deeper into the building, but the creatures are already close behind. At the last second, they dive into a fallen pipe that leads through a hole in the floor into a secret underground bunker. Inside, he rushes them into a large steel furnace and slams the hatch shut behind them leaving a towel over the latch to make sure that they won't be trapped. Clearly, he's thought this out beforehand, and that's good news for the family, but there's still no way to tell if they can trust him. The man immediately tells them that he doesn't have enough food or water to go around and says that they'll need to leave first thing in the morning. Evelyn finally realizes the man's true identity. It's Emmett, their old neighbor from before everything went to hell. Opening the crate, she shows them their newborn infant as a way to get his sympathy, and it seems to work for now. But it's clear that Emmett still hasn't made up his mind about how much he's willing to help. Okay, well, that didn't go as planned. At least they found a pretty good spot for shelter, but the problem is that Emmett here isn't willing to let them stay, so we need to figure out how the two sides can reach a compromise that works for everyone. If it were me, I'd try convincing him to let us stay by pointing out that we have several sets of hands that would make it easier for everyone to do basic survival tasks, like gathering supplies or starting a garden so that they could grow their own food and become more self-sufficient. After all, alone, Emmett is just surviving for the sake of survival, but he could definitely benefit from a sense of community. Plus, he has more weapons and they have the device that allows them to land critical hits on the creatures. Now, you might be able to make the argument that Marcus here should have been more careful about where he was stepping, especially after they tripped that first trap. But to be fair, that's not really possible when you're already busy running for your life. They may have gotten him to shelter, but the poor kid isn't safe just yet. In fact, in fact, he's far from it. He could easily still go into shock from the intense pain which could cause a sudden drop in blood pressure and reduced blood flow to his vital organs, ultimately resulting in his death. There's also a significant chance of the wound becoming infected, leading to complications like tetanus, cellulitis, all which could be fatal in the middle of an apocalypse. They'll need to get their hands on bandages, antiseptics like iodine or hydrogen peroxide, antibiotics, and pain relief like meds and acumifobin and ibuprofen and all the sh 
Also, while we're here at the rail yard, I'd also want to see if I could find anything that we could use to boost the strength of the feedback attack. Since the louder that it gets, the more effective that it'll be. And at the very least, they could convince Emmett to let them stay until Marcus's leg heals up since it was his bear trap that caused all of this. But he doesn't technically owe them any help just because they used to be neighbors. It would stink to come all this way just to turn around, but once Marcus is back on his feet, it seems like the safest thing to do would probably be to take Emmett's advice and go back to the house that they know, where they can plant a garden, keep a low profile, and try to wait everything out. As Marcus is lying on a cot, recovering from his injuries, Emmett reveals that he lost his own sons on the very day of the alien's arrival, while his wife, Nora, passed away from an unknown illness 11 weeks ago, leaving him completely alone despite doing everything that he could to keep his family safe. Upset, Evelyn asks him if he'd seen Lee's signal fire every night, and Emmett admits that he had, but he never once thought about coming to help them. He warns them that the rest of the world isn't as safe as it used to be, and it's not just because of the creatures. The people who are left have practically turned into monsters themselves, and to Emmett, there's no hope of making things right ever again. Just then, Marcus suddenly sits up in bed with a shocked expression on his face. Somehow, the radio has actually picked up some music, a looping broadcast of the song Beyond the Sea. Emmett is the only one who doesn't act surprised, and that's because he's been hearing it every day for the last four months. When Reagan questions why her father never heard it, Emmett explains that it was because their house was at the bottom of a valley. The kids immediately wonder if this could mean that there are other survivors, but Emmett makes it clear that there's no one out there who they'd want to run into, and reminds the family that they need to be gone first thing tomorrow. That night while everyone is asleep, Reagan wakes up her brother and quietly leads him into the hatch so that they can talk without the others overhearing. She's been thinking it over and now she's convinced that Beyond the Sea isn't just a song, it's a message. Using her father's maps and a radio frequency handbook, she was able to figure out that the signal was broadcasting from a station that's located on a cluster of islands just off the coast, which brings a whole new meaning to their choice of song. Reagan explains to her brother that if she follows the train tracks, it will only take her one day's walk to reach a boat dock. From there, she's planning to take a boat, make her way to the island, and help whoever she finds. Best of all, getting to the station would allow her to broadcast the feedback from her cochlear implant, effectively giving everyone with access to a radio the ability to fend off the creatures and possibly saving the world in the process. Marcus begs his sister not to go, but Reagan insists that she has to try, and in the end, he isn't able to convince her. The kids head back to bed, but by the time that everyone wakes up a few hours later, Reagan is already gone, and she left a note on the radio that only says, keep listening. In the morning, Evelyn finds out from Marcus where the girl went and begs Emmett to go get her back before she gets hurt. He hesitates at first, but with no family of his own left to protect, he eventually agrees to help them out one more time. Okay, this is actually a great idea, but there was no need for Reagan to sneak out like this. Everyone knows that they can't stay here at the rail yard forever, so why not just explain her plan to her mother and then go for it together as a group when it was time to do that, huh? Maybe they could even convince Emmett to join them for the trip, since at least making an attempt to find other survivors would be better than just rotting alone here until his supplies eventually run out. They'd only need to wait until Marcus was able able to walk on his own again, and then once he was ready, they could all try this out as a family, instead of Reagan herself going it alone. After all, Evelyn is a proven survivor whose knowledge and skills could go a long way out in the wild, and Reagan should remember all too well what happened the last time that everyone decided to split up. Unfortunately, it looks like Emmett here is going to have to go after her, and he needs to make sure that he's prepared for what he might encounter along the way. If he's lucky enough to even find Reagan still alive, then he's going to have to somehow convince her to come back with him. With that in mind, I'd bring a handwritten note from her mother as a way to win her over, since that would carry more weight than someone who she hardly knows demanding that she listens to him just because he's an adult. Emmett now also knows about the creature's weakness to high-pitched feedback, so I'd be trying to find a way to set myself up with a version of that before heading out. As it turns out, his portable radio might just be the tool that he needs. Emmett could then manipulate the receiver or the antenna to get as close to the speaker as possible. The sound from the speaker should be picked up by the receiver 
creating a source of feedback. And if this works well, then he could use it in the same way that Reagan uses her cochlear implant to deal with any creatures that he might come across. I definitely wouldn't feel 100% certain betting my life on it until it was proven to work, but it could be a helpful tool if he ever ends up in a pinch. Once he gets Reagan, then they'll obviously need to double back to the shelter. But after everyone's safe, the adults should really hear her out about this plan. It genuinely seems like their best option right now, and they'll all be better off if they work together as a team. Although, traveling in a post-apocalypse with a lady, her two kids, and a noisy baby isn't exactly an ideal squad. So I would understand if Emmett here decided to turn them down. Meanwhile, Reagan goes walking by herself all the way to the nearest railroad station, following the tracks until she discovers an abandoned train. Searching the inside, she actually finds an untouched first aid kit hanging on the wall over the driver's seat. But as she leans in to grab it, she accidentally knocks loose a dead body, causing her to let out an involuntary scream and jump back. The noise immediately draws in one of the creatures, and Reagan quickly uses uses the feedback from her implant to stun it. Steadying the shotgun on her knee, she fires a blast aimed directly at the creature's exposed head, but it's only a glancing blow, and the monster starts closing in now more angry than ever, without the strength to load another shell. All that Reagan can do is cower back against the wall, but just when it looks like she's done for, a second shot rings out, finishing the job and saving her life just in time. It's Emmett, and the two of them quickly duck into the nearby station, hiding behind the desk as more of the creatures start searching the area. He quickly explains to the girl that he's taking her back to the hideout as soon as the coast is clear, but Reagan insists that he should help her with the plan instead, finally convincing him by pointing out that this is his chance to help others in the way that he couldn't help his own family. Back at the rail yard, Evelyn and her two kids are nice and cozy using Emmett's shelter and supplies while he's out there risking his life and limb to save her daughter, but she knows that this can't last forever. Their only oxygen tank is about to run out, and Mark Marcus badly needs medical supplies to fight through his injuries. The next day, Evelyn cautiously emerges from the shelter to make a quick supply run into town. Before she can sneak out, Marcus climbs out of the hatch to confront her, begging her not to leave him and the baby behind. But his mother promises him that she'll be back as soon as she gets what they need. Out at the train station, Reagan suddenly wakes up only to realize that Emmett and her weapons are nowhere to be found. Heartbroken, she wanders outside and collapses into the dirt, but just then, Emmett returns turns with all of her stuff whispering to her that he's found a boat. Setting off down the tracks, the two of them cut down a dirt road that eventually leads them to a nearby bridge. From there, they can see a dock full of boats a few miles up the coastline, and the island with the radio tower a bit further off in the distance. It looks like they just might be able to make it after all, but like Emmett said, there are more threats out here than just creatures, and they're about to find out just how right that he is. Okay, this is great news. They've finally found a way to actually get over to the island, but they're about to make a big mistake. I know that they're excited, but the two of them should definitely go back and regroup with the rest of the family first before taking the boat. Either that, or Emmett should return Reagan to her family and then double back to scout the island out by himself first. Just like his own signal fire was a trap to lure in unsuspecting survivors, the message on the radio could definitely be one too. They have no idea what they're going to find out there. There could be raiders, or the place could already be overrun by the creatures, and either way, the chances of it going horribly wrong are much greater than the chances of it going well. All things considered, it would be much better to take the girl back to her mom, explain the plan and why he thinks that it's a good idea, and then decide on what to do next as a group instead of running rushing into it. After all, they literally have all the time in the world and are going to have to double back for the family if they actually do manage to find a safe community anyway. So it's always better to be safe than sorry if you can help it. As Evelyn makes her way back towards town, she stops at the bridge where her youngest son Bo was killed by one of the creatures several months back, tearfully adding her wedding ring to his memorial before continuing along the path. She makes it to the pharmacy without any trouble, and although it looks like the place has already been turned over, she's able to find the medical supplies that she'll need for Marcus, along with two full oxygen tanks in the back closet. So far, so good, but the sun is already low in the sky, and she has no idea that the situation back at the rail yard is about to take a serious turn for the worse. Bored, hungry, and worried about his family, Marcus decides that he's going to have a look around the station for himself. Placing the baby into the crate, he climbs out of the hatch and begins 
spends exploring the building, never noticing that the newborn's air supply is already running critically low. His search leads him up the stairs through more of Emmett's booby-trapped rooms, until he eventually comes to an area that's been sectioned off with shower curtains. Peeking inside, he finds the decomposing body of Emmett's wife, knocking over several items as he loudly crashes to the floor. Knowing that he's just blown his cover, Marcus races back to the hideout as fast as he can, but one of the creatures sees him and starts trying to get inside. Grabbing the baby and their radio, he climbs into the furnace and slams the hatch just as the creature breaks through. But there's a problem. He forgot to block the handle, leaving him and the baby trapped inside with only a limited supply of oxygen to keep them alive. Okay, Marcus, man, what were you thinking here, dude? Was losing your brother and your dad in the same year already not enough for the rest of your family to handle? You just had to go exploring this rusty death trap of a hideout for why exactly? Because you were bored? <laughs> well, I don't think I'm breaking any news here, but Marcus, you f up, doggy. This kid had one job, just stay with the baby and wait. You've got Emmett out there risking his life to save his sister, his mom out getting supplies for him and his baby brother, and meanwhile, Marcus here had a safe place to hide with everything that he needed to make it through the day already provided for him. Honestly, you practically have to try to screw things up this badly. If he'd just waited a few more hours, then Evelyn would have been home with the supplies that they need. With no incident and everything still nice and safe, but not only did Marcus completely blow up their only hiding spot, he's also about to accidentally suffocate them both. It would have been pretty much impossible for him to have made the situation any worse when he clearly had the easiest job out of everyone. And that's just embarrassing, dude. Now, I don't want to be too hard on the kid here because I know that we all make bad decisions sometimes, especially under pressure, but someone's going to have to have a word with him about the consequences of his actions. If they manage to survive this because Marcus, you f up, homie. Night falls as Emmett and Reagan finally arrive at the docks, cautiously making their way around until they find a boat that looks suitable for the trip. Emmett leans down to untie mooring lines when suddenly out of the corner of his eye, he notices a human silhouette quietly rush by. Concerned, Emmett raises his rifle and begins searching for the uninvited guest with Reagan following right behind him. That's when he spots the source of the disturbance, a helpless looking little girl. But when he leans in to comfort her, she instantly tightens a a rope around his neck, attaching him to a fishing net that's been booby-trapped with dozens of loud bells. Suddenly, they're completely surrounded by a group of shabbily dressed raiders, outnumbering Emmett and Reagan five to one. Emmett tries to reason with them, but the men only respond with a blank, remorseless stare, and it's immediately clear that they're the kind of people who he tried to warn the family about the night before. With Emmett unable to fight back, the raiders begin leading Reagan away, but that's when he gets an idea, signaling for the girl to dive into the water. Emmett rushes at the nearest raider and ropes the two of them together with a net full of bells. Hearing the noise, several of the aliens instantly swarm the docks, brutally destroying anyone who's too slow to get out of the way. Taking the leader, Emmett drags him back to a pole and stabs him in the leg, using the man as a meat shield and jumping into the water just as one of the creatures finishes him off. With Emmett in the water, one of the creatures lunges at him from a nearby boat, but as luck would have it, they've just found another weakness. As he watches them struggle to get back to dry land. Reagan pulls him up onto a small boat, and they continue sailing for the island, hoping that what they find there would be worth the trip. Back at the hideout, Marcus starts to panic as he and the baby begin to run out of oxygen, and he realizes that he's trapped them both inside. Returning from her trip, Evelyn hears the commotion and rushes inside, desperately trying to save them before it's too late. Thinking quickly, she places one of the oxygen tanks into a pool of gasoline and fires a single shot into the air, drawing the creature's attention away from her kids. Waiting for just the right moment, she fires another shot into the tank itself, causing an explosion that engulfs the creature in a huge ball of fire, but it's not enough. Thankfully, the smoke triggers the building's sprinklers, allowing her to sneak around the creature and down into the hideout, while the falling water masks the sound of her steps. Evelyn makes it to the hatch and climbs inside with the freshwater tank, reviving Marcus just in time. But the creature follows them in, forcing her to shut the door. This time, she remembered not to lock them inside, but there's nowhere left to go until the creature leaves. Hours later, Emmett and Reagan finally arrive on the island, and to their surprise, they find an entire community 
community of people peacefully living there as if the apocalypse never even happened. The survivors welcome them with open arms, explaining that they've been here since the first day of the invasion, and that Reagan was right all along. The song was really a message after all. As the sun begins to rise, Emmett wanders down to the beach, overcome with memories of his family. It looks like they're finally safe, but just then he notices something horrifying. One of the boats from the dock has also washed up on the island, which means one of the creatures could be there too. Terrified, Emmett immediately sprints back towards the town, shouting for them to get inside just as the creature crashes in and starts turning this peaceful morning into an absolute massacre. After making sure that the children are safe, Emmett, Reagan, and the community's leader jump into his car and lay on the horn as they speed off down the road, attempting to lure the creature away. Okay, it's probably a questionable move to bring Reagan here into the distraction car, but the good news is that they know there's only one of these creatures on the island. If they can find a way to take it out, then they shouldn't have to deal with any more threats, at least for a little while. The speakers from the turntable that the kids were playing with before the attack might have worked as a way to boost the feedback from Reagan's cochlear implant, but they would have needed a weapon to finish the job, and it looks like Emmett lost his rifle during the fight at the the docks. I'm sure they could have found something from around the house to do the trick, but this also would have put the young kids who were hiding out nearby into a bad position if the plan didn't work out. They're going to have to handle things on the fly for now, but once they get rid of the creature, they also need to make sure that they have a plan in place for this if it ever happens again. It's going to take some serious work, but maybe the survivors could set up some speakers around the perimeter of the community to instantly broadcast the feedback. Stunning the creatures and opening them up for a counterattack. This place looks like their best chance at ever getting back to a normal life, so once the fight is over, their next priority should be to make sure that they have a way to keep the island safe from the creatures and bands of troublesome humans alike. The plan works, with the creature chasing after them and tearing the car to shreds until they finally reach the island's radio station and take cover inside the garage. For a moment, the man hesitates, worried that they might have accidentally lost the creature along the way, but his worries are put to rest when the alien reaches under the garage door and drags him out to his death, while Emmett and Reagan retreat into the building. As the creature stalks through the building searching for them, Reagan sees the station's broadcasting equipment and remembers her plan. The two of them sneak around until they come to a sliding window where they can almost get into the broadcast booth. With Emmett helping her through, Reagan quietly climbs over the desk and gets inside, but when she opens the next door, the hinges loudly squeak, alerting the creature to her exact location. Seeing the danger, Emmett dives in and shuts the door behind her, putting himself between Reagan and the monster to buy her time. Thinking that enough time has passed, Evelyn cautiously opens the shelter and sneaks out to get supplies, but the creature has been quietly waiting in the shadows, lunging after her the moment that her back is turned. She manages to get back inside of the shelter at the last second, but isn't quick enough to shut the hatch, and now the creature is coming within inches of killing them all. Just then, Reagan turns on the broadcast and holds her cochlear implant to the microphone, creating a loud burst of feedback that overwhelms the creature's ultra-sensitive hearing, forcing it to retreat. At the same moment, her brother turns on his own radio and is able to use the same frequency to stagger the creature that's trying to kill him. While Marcus uses his mother's revolver to save his family, Reagan buries a sharp metal stick into her attacker's exposed brain, dropping it with a single strike and saving Emmett's life. Finally, they have a reliable way to fight back against the creatures, and a safe place to live, but they'll need to get the rest of the family over to the island first, and that's still a long way to go. Damn, homie, the world is a f***ed up place with these things running around it, and I wouldn't want to be a part of it, but you know... <laughs> So I would have just knocked that shit out the park. Me and my little children running around the apocalypse, never dying once. And they handicap. What? But let me know what you guys thought about this down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a damn good day.